My talk is going to span 60 years. And we're at the 40 year mark now. With lots of momentum for the next 20. I have an innate ability to see a long term view. And I'm not deterred by conventional wisdom because of my optimism. In 2004, I was working, as usual, at my computer on the scientific details and clinical details of a rare cancer in baby's eyes, retinoblastoma. And this picture flashed on my screen. This child was Garata, Ratty for short, and she was in Botswana. A year before this picture was taken, her parents had found a white pupil in the left eye They'd gone to the internet in the Francistown Hotel and recognized their child likely had retinoblastoma. They sent an email out to the world, but no one answered. The correct treatment was eventually done. The eye was removed, and the pathology showed, and the report exists today, showing that she needed more care, more therapy, because it likely had spread from the eye already. But no one read the report. Ratty never got an artificial eye because they didn't have any in, Kenya, in, in Botswana at that time. And then when the orbit swole up one year later, which you might not be able to see, but uh, her parents put this pet picture out. This time they sent it to a parent support website and Abby White answered. And Abby ha herself had had retinoblastoma. Her father had been diagnosed with retinoblastoma in both eyes in Kenya as a baby. But he was sent to England, both eyes were removed, saving his life. He then uh, lived a full, vigorous life with no optical vision, but lots of vision. And uh, Abby herself inherited the predisposition from retinoblastoma from her to get retinoblastoma from her father. So she is legally blind, busy helping families around the world. She worked magic and ratty within three weeks, with many, many people contributing, arrived at the hospital for sick children. One of the first things we did was give her an artificial eye, which was wonderful for Ratty. She felt she was beautiful and belonged with everybody else because she had now two eyes. However, we failed to save her from the tumor, which had already extended from her orbit into her brain. But Ratty has changed the world. She's a very, very important person. So I'll, I'll jump back from 2004 to 1993. I was a resident in ophthalmology at the Hospital for Sick Children and called to the emergency department because there was a child who had cataract in both eyes. The child didn't have cataract in both eyes. The child had retinoblastoma in both eyes. And in this eye, you can see that the retinoblastoma, the white stuff there, has moved from the retina, where the tumor starts, past the lens, past the iris, and is lying right in the front of the eye. We removed this eye, and we gave radiation for the other eye, this child died in one year. But in the meantime, I went to the hospital library and I prepared a presentation for the Department of Ophthalmology to show them about retinoblastoma, which most people knew nothing about. It's very rare. This is the first slide I ever made on retinoblastoma, and I made it with a typewriter and <laughs> colored pencils. This is actually a picture of it. I still have the piece of paper. And that was 60th, 1973. And it's still true today. What, I knew, what we knew then was that the children, this is all different children, uh, had the ones in red had bilateral retinoblastoma, two eyes, like Abby White. The ones in white had retinoblastoma only in one eye, like Ratty. And the difference was that the ones at the top had a predisposition to retinoblastoma. Then I found a paper that was the most exciting, still remains one of the most exciting and important cancer papers ever. 1971, a pediatrician used mathematics to analyze very simple clinical data. He looked at the age of diagnosis of the children with bilateral retinoblastoma compared to those with unilateral retinoblastoma. And he recognized from that he could go leap forward accurately and say cancer can be caused by only two events. And the children who had no predisposition to retinoblastoma needed to get both those events in the cell in the retina that became the cancer, so they only got one, only one eye, 
the children who were predisposed already carried one of those mistaken genes in every cell of their body. So they only needed one more event in the retina and they got their tumors younger. Leaping forward again, we found that 97% of the time we can find the exact mutation in the gene with our technologies that we've developed in each family. They're different in each family. And we found a 3% uh, are caused by a totally different gene. It's an oncogene that drives to retinoblastoma, a different mechanism. This gene protects against retinoblastoma when it's normally normal. So that was the most exciting thing I could possibly imagine. I was convinced that the genetics of retinoblastoma was going to solve all problems for all cancer. That was my naive, forward-looking view, but I was optimistic. Went to New York in my interview with the president of the Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Hospital. He said, why would you work on retinoblastoma? It's a rare, special genetic cancer. No other cancer is caused by genetics. Of course, <laughs> under that the iceberg that was invisible to him, but was quite clear to me, shows that cancer is all genetic. So we worked for many years. The many things we discovered in retinoblastoma later were applied and cross over to all of cancer. For example, the tumor suppressor genes. So you can see the breast cancer is a gene that you know, all of you know, breast cancer can be inherited and it's caused by the breast cancer genes, several of them. Many of them not yet discovered. They aren't found yet, but there are more of them. Colon cancer, renal cell cancer, many, many cancers are initiated by the genes that when they're damaged are gone that would normally protect and those are the tumor suppressor genes. But there's a big active area on the cancer genome. You heard about that in a previous talk about the DNA in the cells, and that's what's damaged in cancer cells. It turns out that one of the main guardians of the human genome that keeps it normal is the retinoblastoma gene. And that's due to our work on retinoblastoma. So there's a lot of resources going into studying the DNA of the individual tumors, not the person that carried the tumor, but the tumor itself, in order to determine by sequencing those, that DNA which therapy would be best for that specific tumor to avoid resistance and giving the bad therapy that isn't going to work anyway. Uh, all that comes from retinal blastoma. Worldwide, 70% of children die of retinal blastoma in countries where there's adequate awareness and adequate healthcare resources and expertise, 2% die. I'll leap forward. We now have a goal for a retinoblastoma to be a zero death disease worldwide. And this shows the number of kids in the world, 8,000 in the whole world each year, newly diagnosed. India has the most each year because they have the highest birth rate. And you only get retinoblastoma in babies up to sort of the age of three or four. So you have to have new births to get retinal blastoma. An aging population doesn't have much retinal blastoma. And China has a lot. They have fewer births, but more population. Canada has 21. What business have we been doing all this research in retinal blastoma in Canada? But it's made a big difference. Kenya, where Abby, uh, uh, Abby's father was diagnosed, and Abby spent her summers, so she was fluent in Swahili, went commonly to her summer breaks to... There's 79 a year predicted. There are actually more because they come from East Africa all into Kenya. And in response to Raddy's death, we declared we better do something for retinal blastoma in Africa. We didn't go to Botswana, we went to Kenya. And the Kenyans were ready for this. They already had worked together, parents and doctors and the Ministry of Health. And they've done an amazing job over the last eight years. The retinal, Kenyan Retinal Blastoma Strategy Group is what it's called. And that's about to devolve not in a negative way, but in a very constructive way with the formation of a brand new organization, the Kenyan Children's Cancer Trust, had never existed before. Other cancers are very neglected compared to retinoblastoma in Kenya. So it's led to a whole broadening and reaching out as well. The model's gone around the world. So worldwide, it's one disease. It's exactly the same everywhere, so why not have optimal care, the same care for every kid in the world? There's only 8,000 of them. That's not many. They all show up worldwide with this white pupil. You can see it, all these children, except that child who's got normal-looking eye in this flat, these flash pictures. The bottom one over there, that's a flash picture taken in Toronto by a five-year-old with her parents' cell phone of her brother diagnosing his retinal blastoma. 
They use the same words worldwide to describe this in every different language. But then what do they do? How do they reach the same problem Raddy's family had? They could not get help. They couldn't mine their way through the health system to find anyone who'd believe them that their child had retinoblastoma. So now we have a, the One Retinoblastoma World Project uh, has a map online. You can go to that URL. Please go there. Look up any center you want in the world, where you want to go to have your child cared. Now they can be diagnosed in Botswana and go to the map and it'll tell them where the expertise is, what lasers they have, what equipment they have, what they can't do there, and what they have to go to another center for. It's all available publicly right now. You'll notice that China, that's China over there, uh, doesn't have many centers mapped. But that's because they just haven't gotten on the website yet because it's a very interesting special model in China. One doctor who did some training here, and he's actually a, a Canadian citizen, he has worked in China. He sees retinoblastoma in 18 different cities. And I followed him between four cities on two different occasions watching him. He'll see 30 to 40 children a day, and he doesn't do anything wrong. In each place, he has a superb, highly tuned expert team of everybody represented. He talks to every family between seeing every kid, and he treats them on the side. It's fantastic. And the Chinese have invented novel therapies. The genetics, the center of genetics, is our lab here in Toronto. But the uh, Chinese have a company doing genetics for cancer, that cancer genome kind of work. They heard about retinoblastoma and working with the family groups with the doctor going to all these centers, and with us, they have a unique model. They do the test in the fancy machines and their technology. We get the data immediately. We interpret it with our deep knowledge of this gene, particularly, and what that sequence might mean. Write the report, they translate the report, and deliver back to the family. It's a fantastic business model. And it really shows one world. So I'll just jump to the next kid, who it really shows the world functioning as one clinic. Weiwei, you may remember, some of you may remember, Weiwei was on the news in Toronto two years ago when he came from China. He'd had one eye removed in China and came here because we had therapies that they couldn't do it as well in China. So he came here. We treated him at sick kids. But then he got to a point where I knew of a therapy they were doing in China that had never been done outside China because it's pretty radical, but I believed in it. And I sent him back to China for that therapy. He came back. We finished the job. And when he went home, um, cured, and he still is. The email pictures from him last week are, look great. Uh, I did a house call in China, and this is way, way with his mother. Can you tell which eye is the artificial one? Nope. I won't tell you. <laughs> he sees very, very well. He's a fantastic kid. We never will say he's cured. We don't like that word, but he has no active disease in his very, very good position. So I don't have a very good memory. Most doctors won't maybe admit that, but when I see a patient that's had complex care already, I couldn't possibly, from the pile of paper this thick in the hospital for sick children, tell you what treatment that child had had. So years ago, I made my own little database in FileMaker Pro, and that let me keep track of my kids. Then I got a better job at PMH and got a whole team of amazing programmers, and they've built what we call now e-cancer care, uh, this is the retinoblastoma module, but we've made e-cancer cares for all different cancers in PMH and beyond and some national. And this is the child, shows up with retinoblastoma in both eyes. You can maybe see the white reflex, which is clear in both eyes. On her staging EUA examination under anesthetic, the red line right there after visits, that's the time when we really evaluate how bad is the disease and what's the treatment plan. And we could tell that she had group D in both eyes, right and left eye. She was treated with chemotherapy. Those orange stripes, you can tell by the legend, are chemotherapy. And the blue diamonds are laser or freezing of the tumors. That's the only treatment she needed. She needed more examinations to check her eyes because we can't look very well without the child being under anesthetic. So the yellow bars are her anesthetics. Eventually, she had genetics because the genetic wasn't ready when she was first diagnosed, so we know all about her genetics. She's now a McGill University student, 20 years later, with useful vision in both eyes. So this database, if I pointed to any one of those symbols, I would see the date of that episode, and if I double-clicked, I'd go right into the final details, even to which laser I'd used, which, how many laser burns were done to which tumor in each eye. All the data is lying underneath that. 
really deep, disease-specific data. So, e-cancer care, retinoblastoma, only the retinoblastoma module, next week goes on a cloud server for the world. Each center that's on the map will have, and there will be 200 centers, will have their children. It'll help the doctors care for the patient because like me, they'll then know what happened to the patient. We've actually used that to show the parents what's happened to their child, but also to use that graphic display, which has no words attached to it. It's language independent. It's all graphics and parents can understand it easily. We've tested that, we've published that, that they can really understand what it means. And we can use that to show a whole bunch of those to the next parents to show, to help them in their inform, fully informed consent for whatever treatment might be planned, because they can see what that treatment did to other kids. Uh, but once we've got this global sector, each center will have their own fully identified care, uh, and anyone in the circle of care of each child will be able to access that directly from wherever they are in the world. Uh, but when we de-identify the data, we can pull it together from the whole world. We won't be studying a subset. We won't actually need statistics because we'll be studying the whole world of retinoblastoma in one database. And then we can have a very smart algorithms that aren't built yet. This is projecting the momentum forward to mine that data on the fly. So we can be looking all the time the next result, the next outcome, in any kid, anywhere, pulling them together with the big machine underneath. And the next doctor anywhere in the world can ask the database, the doctor and the parents, ask the database for the evidence for which treatment's going to give the best outcome for each eye of my child today and the whole child. So that's a learning health system. It will feed back and learn all the time. This is a very new phrase. It's just becoming, there's some really good papers out on that. It's very new. Then I'm going to come to prevention. These families are haunted by the second cancer they're going to get through their whole life because of the retinoblastoma gene. So we're highly motivated to try and prevent cancer. And we have the perfect model in retinoblastoma. Retinoblastoma, again, is the lead for much bigger things. When babies are known to carry their parents' retinoblastoma mutation that will predispose them to getting cancer in both eyes, retinoblastoma in both eyes, we deliver them by choice four weeks early. Four weeks, they're not premature, but early, early, earlier than the 40 weeks, which would be normal, because then we can start to laser tumors that are so small, they're actually invisible, and we can find them with special tools. We can see that they have a tumor here or there. Those are tumors threatening vision, so we can treat them. In mice, from all the studies around the retinoblastoma gene and other, and all the genetics of cancer, we have three drugs now that if you put them on the eye of a mouse that you may genetically get retinoblastoma, it will block the tumor in a mouse. So we want to set up a clinical trial, which won't get going for a year or two, because there's many, many layers of hurdles to get through to this, where every baby who's predisposed to retinoblastoma will be delivered at 36 weeks gestation, and the drops delivering the drug will be put on one eye, and all we do is count tumors for three years. We won't change the treatment of the children at all, because we still will be watching both eyes. Any tumor that shows up, we treat with the laser. It will be exactly the same we hope the eye with the drug, or we'll keep working till we have a drug that gives fewer tumors in the eye that gets the drug than the other eye. Built-in control. We might have, we might, we'll probably do that globally. India would be the best place to do it because there's more babies born with retinoblastoma and more bigger families so that we might get more than one baby in one family who could get these treatment on the eye. Then that treatment, it's the only cancer, only human cancer you can show prevention. Otherwise you'd have to be doing a preventive therapy for 30 years for other cancers only retinoblastoma can be done like this. Then we'll take that drug, make it a systemic therapy, and uh, be able to prevent the second cancers in retinoblastoma patients. And then what's stopping us from preventing any cancer? <laughs> I'm now 70 years old, as you heard, <laughs> and healthier than ever because of mindfulness. My life has so far confirmed that optimism pays off and solving small problems has big impact 
and cancer will one day be prevented. Thank you.